In June 2019, Taylor Swift's former manager, Scooter Braun, acquired Big Machine for $300 million. Big Machine was the record label to which Taylor was previously signed. As part of this deal, Scooter acquired the master recorded rights to six of Taylor's previous albums, namely Taylor Swift, Fearless, Speak Now, Red, 1999, and Reputation. This was an infuriating revelation to Taylor, who felt as though she'd been cheated out of an opportunity to own her own master recorded rights. She had previously expressed a desire to own her rights to the big machine label boss, Scott Borchetta. But Taylor was offered a deal which would have meant that for every new album she released with the label, she would have been given the right to one older album. So in essence, one new album for one old. This, as you can imagine, was not an attractive offer to Taylor, so she signed elsewhere at Republic, foregoing the ability to own the master recorded rights to her first six albums. Now, for those of you who have followed Taylor's career closely, you would know that something here doesn't stack up. While she purports to not have known about the Scooter Braun deal before it happened, some folks think this is hard to believe. And this is because Taylor's father owned a percentage of the record label to which she was previously signed, Big Machine. And so it may come across as strange that she heard nothing or knew nothing about the sale of Big Machine to Scooter Braun, but that's neither here nor there. So going back to our story, now that Taylor had settled and was making music at her new home, Republic, she was still frustrated with the way things had played out at Big Machine. One key frustration of hers in particular was the fact that her former manager Scooter Braun, whom she clearly disliked, owned the master recorded right to her first six albums. Because of this, she decided to re-record those works, labeling them Taylor's version for ease of identification. This was so fans knew exactly which version she'd like them to support. But then in October 2020, Scooter Braun resold the Big Machine catalog to Shamrock, the private equity arm of Disney focused on music, media, and entertainment for approximately $400 million. Now, this quick flip meant that Scooter made himself a nice bit of profit and that he wouldn't have to deal with the impact of Taylor Swift re-recording her work from a financial perspective. What do I mean from a financial perspective? Well, it's because for every fan who supports and listens to a Taylor's version of a song, that's one less fan who listens to the original. Ultimately, this would mean that the original would generate less income because of the competition from a credible alternative in Taylor's version. So by now, you're probably thinking, thanks for the hyperbole, mate, but what's that got to do with private equity? Well, the Scooter Braun trade illustrates very well something which private equity firms try to do, buy low and sell high. In this video, we'll discuss the influx of private equity firms playing in the music space, their motivations, and whether it's been to the detriment of music. So sit tight while we discuss why private equity wants to own music. So first, let's begin by discussing exactly what private equity is. A private equity firm is one that raises funds from investors to acquire assets with the aim of selling the acquired assets for more money at some point in the future. The investors in a private equity fund are typically pension funds, high net worth individuals, family offices, endowments, and insurance companies. And now that we understand at a high level what a private equity firm is, let us quickly go through an example of a private equity deal. If a target business has a value of $10 million and the investors in the fund raise $1 million, then the remaining $9 million will be raised from a bank to acquire this company. Once the business has been acquired, private equity companies increase the value of a business to shareholders by doing the following. Selling assets in the business, which could be buildings and or machinery owned by the business. Another method employed is cost reduction, which typically involves lowering headcount and or purchasing from cheaper suppliers. And lastly, another method, which is perhaps more relevant to music catalog acquisition is revenue enhancement. Now, revenue enhancement can be achieved in a number of ways. Firstly, by increasing prices of the current product range, or secondly, diversifying into new product ranges. After a private equity firm has increased the value of an acquired company, it will typically look to exit by selling the business to another firm for an amount 
greater than the one which was paid. Now, for the sake of our example, let's say the business that was acquired for 10 million was sold for $20 million. That would mean that the PE firm would earn 20 million minus the 9 million owed to the bank plus interest of let's say 1 million, which leaves the firm with $10 million. That represents a return on investment of 10 times the initial investment of $1 million. This structure is known as a leveraged buyout or an LBO, and it's a structure that's used a lot in music private equity. What's important to note with an LBO is that the acquired business is responsible for the repayment of bank debt, not the private equity firm. As it pertains to music private equity, the underlying cash flow generating asset, the music royalty income, will be used for debt servicing and not money from a private equity firm. But going back to how private equity firms add value to acquired businesses or assets, the first two methods of value creation do not really apply to music royalty acquisition. When you buy music rights, you're not buying a whole business, unless of course you're buying a record label, but we'll assume that's not the case. So assuming you're just buying music rights, in this case, you won't have physical assets or machinery to sell. In addition, you don't have many costs to cut as you're not trimming the fat of a traditional business. After all, the asset in question is a stream or streams of royalty income. Where private equity companies could add value is in the revenue enhancement department. Now, PE firms could increase revenues by exploiting the catalog further. This could be done by re-releasing older material, releasing previously unreleased material, placing the music in film, commercials, and or sporting events, and exercising an audit right. I won't go into great detail about audit rights in this video, but if you'd like to know more, then let me know down in the comments below. In any case, I'll be sure to leave a good article about this topic down in the information section of this video. So now that we understand what private equity is, why is it interested in music? Typically, a private equity firm would be interested in music rights for the following reasons. To receive consistent cash flows for the next 20 to 30 years. Or secondly, to flip the asset via a buy low, sell high strategy, as demonstrated by the Scooter Braun trade at the beginning of this video. Now, as music is not correlated to traditional asset classes such as stocks, bonds and real estate, it's been deemed a good diversifier of an investment portfolio. To add to this, and for context, Goldman Sachs has estimated that the industry will grow by 8.3% by 2030, with the majority of this growth coming from streaming. There is also the argument that music is still undervalued and there exists an opportunity for music to be further exploited. The scope for streaming to reach more people exists, especially in markets such as Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Now, this means that owners of catalog today could benefit from an uplift in music royalty income without doing much to manually increase its value. So in addition to music royalties being uncorrelated to traditional assets, they could also have passive income characteristics, which are attractive to many investors. Now, for those in the business of flipping, which is a more speculative one, music could also be of great interest. Today is probably not the best time to sell a catalog especially as the recent news of hypnosis having to write down catalog has had widespread impact on the rest of the market. But buying now relatively cheaply when considered to the market in 2021 could be a good opportunity, assuming you can sell the catalog for a higher valuation in the future. Add to this equation leverage, which is often used when acquiring music catalog. This could amplify investment returns. Now to give context, Let's assume you buy a catalog for $10 million cash. Five years later, you sell this catalog for $20 million. This represents a return of two times. However, if we assume you can buy a catalog for $10 million, but using 1 million of your own cash and the remaining 9 million borrowed from a bank, this changes the picture entirely. If the same catalog is then sold for $20 million five years later, the return would be $20 million minus the nine owed to the bank plus interest of let's say 1 million leaving you with $10 million or 10 times your initial investment of $1 million. As this illustration demonstrates, using leverage can be a very powerful tool, but it can also be very risky as this strategy relies heavily on asset values either remaining flat or increasing for things to make sense. So buy now 
You're probably wondering, who are the players in the market? Well, there are two main types of private equity companies which buy music rights. There are traditional private equity companies and music companies with a private equity spin. Some of the traditional firms which operate in the space are Blackstone, KKR and Apollo. So the usual suspects. These guys are not in the music business per se. They like the diversification benefits of owning music catalog and they'd be open to trading music assets for the right price at any time. Their approach tends to be more passive as they do not have the personnel internally to fully exploit music rights. On the other hand, there are music companies involved in the space which have a slightly different motive, or at least they purport to. These guys have the internal know-how, infrastructure and personnel to be able to manually exploit music rights. Because they're music companies at their core, they already have teams in place to work on re-releases, releases of unreleased work, placing music in film and commercial ads, etc. They can also encourage newer, hotter, more relevant roster acts to sample catalogue work with the view of sparking fan interest in the catalogue work. So for example, if I had Drake signed to my label as a new artist, but I also owned the rights of Teddy Pendergrass, I might encourage Drake to sample Teddy Pendergrass with the view of sparking interest in the Teddy Pendergrass catalogue via Drake. Music companies who operate like this, but also buy and sell catalog like private equity firms include BMG, Sony and Universal. So again, the usual suspects. Now that we've gone through the differences between traditional private equity and music and music centric private equity, the question is, which is better? The real answer is that it depends on the seller of the rights. Artists sell catalogs for different reasons and they may deem the best home for their legacy, a stuffy New York office filled with Harvard grads who wear ill-tailored suits. Or they may not care about legacy at all and just want to sell their catalogue to the highest bidder to give their kids and or former spouse some cash. Having said that, let me know what you guys think about private equity firms buying up music rights down in the comments below. Whilst there, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. So is private equity's involvement in the space good for music as a whole? That's a loaded question, but on the whole, I would tend to say yes. What private equity does is provide an alternative to artists looking to sell rights. Rather than having the same names bidding for music rights, it creates a real market allowing artists to see where their art is valued amongst the vast pool of participants. Because of the variety of market participants, if an artist is conscious about legacy and what is done with their work post-sale, they may be inclined to sell to a buyer who has a solid reputation of appropriately using an artist's work, such that it doesn't negatively affect the artist's image. Of course, the speculative nature of a lot of market activity may be deemed as negative, but on the whole, I think most private equity firms in the space want to ensure artists are ultimately happy because the huge outpour of artists who feel ripped off or hard done by will be a PR disaster for private equity firms in the space. So what does the future hold? I think we'll continue to see deal making as there'll always be an artist who's perhaps suffered a nasty divorce and needs cash or someone who's fed up with touring and would like to cash out on royalty income so that they can stop pretending to care about their fans for another decade or two. I think we'll also see more firms focused on specific genres and smaller niches. What do I mean? Perhaps firms focusing on music from the Latin and African regions and or less headline grabbing genres like jazz, for example. In the immediate future, with the recent news of hypnosis and an increased interest rate environment, I would forecast less market activity. But for how long? I'm not sure. What I am sure of though, is that firms will be more selective than ever when it comes to deal making. So sellers of rights may find it more difficult in achieving a price for their work similar to what they would have in 2021. In any case, please let me know what you guys think of private equity's involvement in music down in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching. If you like this video, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.